Welcome back to A People's Guide to Publishing. I'm Joe Beal, the founder and CEO of Microcosm Publishing and Distribution. I'm also the author of A People's Guide to Publishing, which distills what I've learned from selling millions of books over the past 25 years. I'm Ellie Blue. I'm the Editorial and Marketing Director here at Microcosm. We are an independent midlist publisher based in Portland, Oregon and Cleveland, Ohio. We have over 700 books, over 25 employees, and we make about 40 new books every year. And we distribute thousands of titles from other publishers. We started this podcast so that we can share what we've learned with newer publishers so that you can learn from our mistakes. Or maybe you just want to understand the publishing industry. This week, we are going to answer a reader question. Well, Bernie will be answering it today. Mm, okay. Well, good luck, bud. Are you ready, Bernie? <laughs> can publishers be sued over scientific problems with factual information? Does factual liability ever become a publishing consideration? What constitutes due diligence on the part of the publisher with the information they publish? Unfortunately, I don't think this is Bernie's area of expertise. Ooh. What do you think, bud? All right. Shall we speak for you? He's taking a nap now. That is his area of expertise. Mm, okay. Okay. Or maybe he just this is that's the answer. Nonverbal communication. So this is a great question about fact checking and liability. Mm hmm. Whew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is complicated. I mean or it's kind of complicated. Like uh you may have followed there was an instance uh a year or so ago where um the book uh, that was like the COVID denying book about um, I can't remember the author but it was basically like does COVID exist or something and you're like surprise surprise what this author thinks and um, and you know Elizabeth Warren was getting all hot and bothered about trying to censor the book, you know, like actually censor the book, like as the government, you know, <laughs> because it like contained misinformation and they felt like it was actively damaging misinformation. But I will tell you, no liability problems, you know, and like, honestly, a smart publisher can kind of leverage stuff like that as marketing. Like if you do get sued or if you do get attacked for yeah your books. yeah um, I mean in this case like you don't really get sued for stuff like that because like who would sue you you know like you you really like the only time that there's a lawsuit over a book is like in like personal disparagements <laughs> like right. or, or, you know if you're like Donald Trump and I are BFFs and then Donald Trump is like I do not know Joe Beal which is true <laughs> That's so just clear say. my good name <laughs> I mean you could like this is the United States you could get sued for anything by anyone at any time like you yeah. being liable does not prevent someone from suing you but like is it likely to happen no, if it does happen, would it be for anything that you would ever expect? No. Yeah. And this is more like, you know, this is sort of the birth of, like, how class action suits came to be, is that people figured out that nobody would actually go after somebody because their personal benefit and or outcome would be so minuscule that they were like, wait a minute. But if everybody was in on the same suit against, say, you know... Marlboro or whomever mm -hmm. you know that's a different story and so um, things like that happen on occasion but again it's like or somebody really takes umbrage with like bad science or um, you know in a lot of cases what happens in practice is so and so bernie the dog writes a book that is like is covid real or like bernie astrophysics not what they're cracked up to be or like einstein was wrong about everything and then you know they'll pitch it to like harvard and yale and you know and, and the, all these presses are like you know they have like boards of accredited people that like are scientists that like read the book and are like 
Well, A, there's nothing of value here, and B, everything in this book is wrong. So. See, it's written by a dog. <laughs> well, <laughs> Ellie's speciesism, not besides, you know. He just doesn't have the credentials that they're looking for at the university presses. That's true. They are, and that's a little unfair. They do want credentials more than they actually want information, and you can follow some like of the much more juicy scandals about people with credentials publishing bad information in one case like as written by an AI and in one case as like just complete gibberish constructed into sentences and then nobody would admit they didn't know that it meant nothing. Okay well to take a real life example um, oh, okay. Regnery recalling the 2000 Mules book mm -hmm. after it had already hit bookstores. Right, right. Because That's a good of one. That's a good publishing example. errors. <laughs> error. Perhaps the error was to publish the book at all. I know. I, I really liked that <laughs> even people that are like incredibly conservative people are like, there's no vetted or credible information in any of this. You know, even people that like serve political gains by believing in that are like, well, you know. I guess the information just hasn't <laughs> surfaced yet, despite a film and a book and a lot of claims. And it sounds like the problem, like the New Yorker got a copy of the book and read it and then talked to some of the people that were quoted in it and the people quoted in it were furious that they had been apparently misquoted in it, so that may have been... One of that wasn't the problem. That wasn't. <laughs> I, I mean, mean I'm that, sure Regnery got like threatened. Legally, oh, and that's the oh, oh problem, you mean you know? legally, right? Yeah. right. I was going to say that's not the problem with the book's information. The problem with yeah. the book's information is that there is none. I mean, a lot of books are treated as entertainment only, political books. Yeah, right, right. And so, like, right, when you read, and this is sort of like how people get away with murder, even in a book like 2000 Mules, is they'll have a phrase like, critics believe that it is possible that Some say. this could have happened, you know, and you're like, well, that is a true statement, you know, <laughs> and you're like, critics of what? Where are they saying this? Like, how has this information been vetted? And in this case, yeah, it's like a great example because you're like, you can publish the book, people will probably buy the book. Very few people will probably read that book, so you kind of get away with murder in those cases. So, so we have two issues here, though. We have the like legal issue, like what do you do to protect your, like how do you protect yourself legally, and then we have the like what is your duty to the reader issue, which I would say. Damn, Ellie, that's good. There's much more, much more that you need to do in terms of your duty to the reader than in terms of. <laughs> covering your ass legally as a publisher. Right, right. And so what happens a lot is those books that are declined by university presses for good reason, usually, they can then go to like an independent who doesn't have a board of scientists who will be like, oh, this book reads really well and it's really interesting and informative. And then they can, they'll be like, yeah, we'll just get an editor to fluff it up and make sure there's like, you know, like, nobody that's quoted in this book that is starkly saying the opposite of what it says they're saying. And, you know, and it's pretty easy to fall into a hole, especially when, like, you know, like, the Soviet government maintains an office of disinformation to convince people of things that are not true in the United States solely for the point of spreading dissension, you know? And so you, this is something you run into a lot with science, you know, is that you'll, you'll, it's easy to be duped. You know, it's easy for smart people to be duped. We wrote about this a lot in How to Be Accountable, how even intelligent people can easily be tricked by bad information presented by credible sources, you know? Yeah. And I mean, like fact checking is, it is hard to do fact checking when it's like one of many editorial duties. Like we don't have a separate fact checker. Right. We never had, we rely on our editors for that. We sometimes use some app that we put the book through to make sure there's no plagiarism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But it is like one, and it's something that, you know, like often does kind of fall by the wayside. Right. Easily, especially if you're rushing a book to print. Like, it is easy to publish misinformation of a small or a large nature. I think it's harder to publish, like, an entire book based, <laughs> founded on a false premise, if everybody's doing their job. Oh, it happens a lot. 
It does. It happens a lot. And and this is sort of the <laughs> thing where, you know, it's just easy to get excited about a bold yeah. claim and not unpack it to the source. You just have to put on your like most skeptical hat, especially at the acquisitions phase, and then also at every other phase. But the earlier you can catch it, the cheaper it is, that's for sure. So, you know, in part, like, while you... I, and not to get all Adam Smith on you, but like a lot of the solution kind of works itself out. You know, most publishers that do have liability, it's because, you know, a book will say something like, this person is a murderer, or, you know, this person like spreads dog food on their neighbor's doorknob, you know. I don't know why you would do that. But, th you know, things like that that are probably untrue and not provably true like that is kind of the greatest source of liability especially if you're like going after a living person that can prove that those claims are not certified in any way you know so it's like one thing if like the new york times reported this detail it's another thing if this is the first time that it's ever appeared in print those tends to be the way that a book is pulped because of some you know, often one line in the book whereas um the solution for misinformation often is you know smart people will tear it to shreds and be like well there's really nothing here and you know i tried to be into this book and i really got excited about it and it made all these big promises and then you read it and it isn't very good because nothing in it is credible you know, and so it will kind of die on the shelf that way. And so, not foolproof. I mean, there are plenty of examples where people will come back and, like, not have read the book, but be like, I heard that the cat killed John Kennedy, you know? And you're like, well, yeah, but if you read the book, there's nothing that actually shows that to be true. And, um, you know, plenty of things like that, though. And especially, like, increasingly now. So, it publisher unless you the whole bailiwick of the publisher is to kind of sell bold claims that most readers know are false or merely want them to be true I think fox news or what is that the world weekly news weekly world news weekly world news yeah if you're selling f f fake facts as entertainment and everybody knows it that's one thing mhm mm but in cases where it would actually change minds not really so much it's kind of more for the culture wars yeah so check your facts thanks for joining us once again please send your questions to podcast at microcosmpublishing.com so we can answer them on future episodes and please give us five stars on itunes and everywhere else that podcasts are reviewed you can find us on the internet at microcosm.pub on twitter at microcosm on Facebook at Microcosm Publishing. On Instagram at Microcosm underscore pub. And here in Portland, Oregon on North Williams Avenue. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week.